everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and I am back with one of my long-awaited reading wrap-ups. Long-awaited by a niche part of this audience. So I have been reading pretty much non-stop since my hiatus, and some of these are actually from before my hiatus, but like, I hadn't read enough of them to film, long story short. So today I am going to be doing a wrap-up of approximately half of the nonfiction I read over the last almost six months, because it's been that long. Now these are not the mountaineering disaster nonfiction books that I have been teasing you guys about. A few of them were in my best of the year wrap up in December. Because I read so many of those, I decided to make it a standalone video. I decided to read even more so that I could do like a definitive-ish like you want the non-fiction mountaineering disaster and memoir wrecks, I'm gonna give them to you. So that is going to be coming soon because I'm, I'm reading more books right now. I have a problem. It's fine. So this is all the rest of the nonfiction I have read, starting with The Devil's Candy by Julie Salomon. And you're like, ooh, what a title. Indeed. This is, this is weird though. This is a weird one. It's very like niche. It was a book I had never heard of about a movie, the production of a movie I had heard of but never seen. And I actually got this wreck sideways from YouTube. I was watching a video which I will track down and then link to down below. It's one of those really fantastic film commentary channels, kind of niche, and it was about the perfect shot. And it talked about this shot from the specific movie from like 1990, and it mentioned how this movie was a hot mess. Like the production is notorious for being like really bad, and he mentioned The Devil's Candy, and I was like, well that sounds like a book I want to read. <laughs> so I read this book about this. 30 year old movie that I had never seen and I did end up watching it on HBO Max. The movie is Bonfire of the Vanities. It was a stinker of a film starring Tom Hanks, Melanie Griffiths with a brief appearance by Morgan Freeman who I thought was one of the better parts of the movie and then it's funny reading about the behind the scenes production part of it. It's based on a literary novel published in the 80s that was a big hit by Tom Wolfe called Bonfire of the Vanities. It's meant to skewer upper class New York Manhattan society and kind of airs and graces and race relations of the time, kind of, in a way. I, I, I'm vaguely interested to read it, but not quite. And the movie is notorious for costing a ton of money for having a really dramatic, messy production and then being a massive, massive flop for Warner Brothers. I am generally fascinated by Hollywood. And I work in the industry, like not the cool like movie parts of the industry, but I'm a big movie fan. And if you are a film production, film financing, <laughs> like behind the scenes nerd, I highly recommend this book. In fact, I recommended it to a friend of mine who works in film financing and I was like, this book is juicy if you are interested in film financing. And yeah, it's just this fascinating portrait because they embedded this reporter in the production because no one thought it was going to be a big flop. Like it was supposed to be a home run. Brian De Palma was directing this best-selling novel adaptation at a major studio, huge budget. They got Tom Hanks attached. Melanie Griffiths was on the rise. She was fresh off of Working Girl for the most part. If the filming angle just changed, it's because my cats just crawled under the rug and knocked the camera over. We're back. They embedded this journalist in the production because they thought it was going to be like a hit and said it was a flop and she wrote this book. I personally found it gripping but it is very inside baseball. It's not that you can't enjoy it if you don't know about the film industry but I am just old enough and I remember just enough of the 80s and definitely the 90s to have enough cultural context and definitely film context for a lot of the stuff that's mentioned in the book. So I found it really cool. I do think if you have zero context, you might have to do a bit more Googling to, to get some of the context because the book was published in the early 90s after this movie came out and really hasn't been significantly revised since then. I think there is an updated afterward in the ebook that I read, but like it's very like assumes you know <laughs> the timing and the context. But I loved it and I, I just think it is must-read nonfiction canon if you are a movie nerd, especially kind of of that era. It's a look into big blockbuster movie financing and like politics between studios and stars and the kind of stuff that goes on and like the book names names. It says like 
which other actors were up for the roles and then like the nasty things that were said about them when they didn't get them or did get them and why certain people left the movie and were brought on to the movie. There's this whole scandal that's infamous about how Melanie Griffiths got a breast augmentation in the middle of production and so if you watch the movie her boobs change. I just find this stuff really really interesting and then it's super interesting if you watch the movie. I'll say that like I didn't think it was as horrifically bad as it was as the flop that it is but it is kind of boring which is probably the last thing it needs to be and I think it had definitely suffered from some miscasting. But one thing it does have is a fantastic opening tracking shot. It is fascinating to watch. It's really good. Oh, I forgot the other thing. I front loaded with Tom Hanks and Melanie Griffiths. Bruce Willis is in this movie and I think he is very miscast and there's like drama with him as well. It's just it's it's a definitely a messy movie, but it's very, very interesting to watch 30 years later. So yeah, I really enjoyed the book and I was in that like old Hollywood mood. That's obviously not old Hollywood, but I went right to Me and My Shadows by Lorna Luff because we love a good Judy Garland book. This is not my first Judy Garland book, but the first I read in a really long time, like the last time I read a Judy Garland book predates this YouTube channel and even I don't even know if I marked the ones that I read in the past on Goodreads that's how long ago it was but Judy Garland is fascinating her life is fascinating and tragic and Me and My Shadows is written by her daughter Lorna Luft. Lorna is Liza Minnelli's younger half sister because Judy had more than one marriage and reading the story of her mother from Lorna's point of view is really really interesting and this isn't simply a Judy Garland book. The first half is what it was like growing up being Judy Garland's daughter. And it does cover Judy's childhood, the family background, Judy in her prime, and all the things that led to Judy's downfall. And Lorna was on the front lines of that downfall. She was she was a kid and you know she was part of that life and watching her mother decline. And Lorna is very raw and honest in this book. If the name sounds familiar, it did to me. Uh, it was turned into a mini series on CBS that won a bunch of Emmys. It was based on this book, which I did end up watching. And so the second half, because you know Judy died tragically, is then what it was like afterwards. You know, what it's like grieving a mother who was famous and meant a lot to a lot of people, but how that complicates your grieving process. Because to you, your mother was a person and not just a person, a complicated person. I mean, Lorna describes a loving but abusive home. That is the reality. I mean, Judy was, you know, Judy had a lot of problems, especially in the later years. Um, and the complicated emotions that come from that as a child who loses a mother in that way, but you know, that kind of mother as well. Um, her relationship with her sister Liza. And like, I was familiar with Lorna Luft specifically from Grease 2. <laughs> she was in Grease 2 and I was like, ooh. So if you watch my review of the Haley Mills memoir, uh, I have the I don't have the same criticism for this book as I had for that one. This book scratched the itch. Even though this book, I think it was published like 20 years ago, so at this point it is dated in many ways. But it didn't stop <laughs> at like before the stuff that was contextually interesting to me as a child of the 80s. So I appreciated that. Like Lorna goes through, like she partied at Studio 54. She was friends with Warhol. She also got into drugs and alcohol. She had drama with her sister Liza. There were rehabs. She talks about making Grease too and you know kind of goes into the the 90s and I appreciated getting that like full like because you basically get from like her mother's birth and childhood all the way up into the 90s and I like that kind of full scope of it and there was just some good Hollywood stuff like they it was Judy Garland they were friends with famous people so Lorna grew up with Lauren Bacall's kids and I just love those kinds of little details so if you also like old Hollywood and those sorts of memoirs but like old Hollywood that transitions into like the 70s and 80s of Hollywood famous kids that kind of stuff I I personally really liked it and I do recommend it if that sounds up your alley Next on the memoir train, I read You Can't Be Serious by Cal Penn. So Cal Penn is a pretty famous South Asian actor 
actor who turned White House employee, which is just, just the coolest trajectory. And yeah, you get a snapshot of that from, you know, being a young kid, you know, child of immigrant parents in, in the United States and deciding he wants to be an actor. He is a comedian, like he does comedic acting. And so it's a funny book. I laughed out loud more than once, though he does tend towards gross out humor here and there. I mean, he was in the Van Wilder <laughs> series, but like there's some good jokes, especially poking fun at his childhood and his parents, his upbringing, went to UCLA to study acting. And he talks about, you know, trying to break into the industry in the 90s and some of the obstacles that he faced specifically because like, you know, that he would be asked to play other ethnicities if he was asked to play a part at all. And all of the things that he kind of came up against and struggled with, his breakout, how he ended up at the White House working for the Obama administration. You know, he talks about working on house and leaving house and then going to the White House. And I found that part of the book really, really interesting where he just talks about what it was, how he got there, but what it was really like to work a government job during the Obama administration. He talks about meeting his now fiance. I think he still is fiance. And that's like a big thing with the book. It's, it's partly what got it on my radar. He did an AMA on Reddit and I think I also saw a TV interview with him. Um, he very recently came out as gay and it's, I, what I really liked about the memoir is it's treated like an incidental thing. Like, like he talks a bit about it, like that it, you know, definitely wasn't easy coming out, but he, I just love how it's like, and I met the man who would become my fiance and this is our meet cute. And I liked that you just, you get that snapshot of his life, but that's the one thing. Like if you like celebrity memoirs and I do where they really dig in and I'm going to talk about one in a little bit where like they name names and they spill the tea or whatever you want to say. Um, it's way easier to write those sorts of memoirs when you are older. <laughs> And not that your career's over, but like, it doesn't matter if you piss people off or maybe some of the offenders are no longer with us. And Cal Penn is very young and Cal Penn still has a bright career ahead of him. So he doesn't name all the names. And he also, he doesn't like, this isn't, this isn't a book about coming out or being gay. And so that's just really not a part of the narrative other than the refreshing aspect that I mentioned. So if, if you are, curious about that as well. This isn't a book that's going to go super in depth with that. It's just, it has the cute me cute and the engagement story and that kind of stuff in it. But yeah, it was just a memoir that I enjoyed. Oh, there are penis pics in it. I said he had some slight gross out humor, but that was one of the laugh out loud moments. But that's the kind of stuff you're going to get. Like he's telling you about his life and his career, but he also makes dick jokes. That, that is this book in a nutshell. And I, I was amused by it. It was a very quick read. I laughed out loud in public more than once. So if that sounds up your alley, definitely pick it up. Probably gonna be less up your alley if you're not already a fan or if you you like the more kind of hard hitting in depth memoirs. But he's also a really good writer. I do have to say that like, like above average writing and I would really look forward to like if he does another one in like 20 years I would definitely read that that like kind of like has more of the reflection and can like name more names especially some of the people who were awful to him in the 90s like very curious about that Next, I did a reread. Uh, I just, you know, I, I'm on the mountaineering <laughs> nonfiction disaster kick and it, there was something else. Point is, I reread the novella. It's like nonfiction novella, Three Cups of Deceit by John Krakauer. So this is one that I read years ago when it came out. It is a scathing takedown of Greg Mortensen, who wrote Three Cups of Tea, this massive bestseller, and had this nonprofit. Well, and this this account by John Krakauer dissects lies, exaggerations, does some like fascinating forensic accounting. It was published a little over 10 years ago, and it I remember kind of the response and the blowback at the time, and I was just like, 
want to read this again, especially because it takes place in parts of Pakistan that come up in these mountaineering books that I read because he was coming back from a failed K2 expedition when this whole thing kicked off. So I reread that. I actually did it as an audiobook. I loved the audiobook performer. Like you can hear the rage and I'm like, you've definitely captured John Krakauer's voice really, really well. So no matter which format you choose, I read it originally as an ebook and then I got an audiobook from the library to reread it. Um, it is, it's brisk, it's short, it only takes a couple hours to listen to um, and it's a fast read. If you're just like, if you're like, what? What are you talking about? Scandal? Yeah, it's an American guy who created this nonprofit to build schools in Afghanistan. And he had this elaborate story of being kidnapped by the Taliban and like that's how he ended up making this promise to build these schools and it's a takedown of things that aren't true and things that are exaggerations but also some of like the shady people who were involved and financial malfeasance and nonprofits buying tens of thousand copies of his own book to make him a bestseller so it's like a, it's got a little bit of the publishing tea with like nonprofit malfeasance and like a a big figure who like it's a really interesting read. Um, I'd say if you are also a fan of Bad Blood and the whole Theranos scandal or anything like Empire of Pain, Things with the Sacklers, it's got a similar vibe in terms of like a larger than life figure who centers himself in a narrative and maybe was scamming people. I mean, was definitely scamming people. It was interesting. I went to the Goodreads page because I didn't originally rate it on Goodreads. And yeah, there are Greg Mortensen's defenders in the comments. There are people who hate this and are like, this is just a bitter takedown piece by John Krakauer. And like, yeah, maybe. But yeah, Greg Mortensen deceived a lot of people in the mountaineering community, including really famous mountaineers. He got them to donate money to sit on the board. And then it came out that like, there was like, issues with embezzling and fraud. So yeah, people aren't happy, but it's a really, really interesting read if that kind of thing sounds interesting to you. Next, you know, my, a lot of my nonfiction, it, you can see the clear inspiration. Yeah, I saw House of Gucci and I was like, I wanna read that book, especially because I came out of House of Gucci with mixed slash confused feelings. It's very long, it's a little like, it's a little overlong. It had some issues with like story focus, and I, but it made me very, very interested in the real story. And then I watched a Hot Lamode, did a video on it and said that like, it, it really wasn't like House of Gucci, the book it's based on, because House of Gucci really, you know, goes into the weeds on Gucci and Hot Lamode is a fashion channel, uh, a haute couture fashion channel. And I was like, well, now I have to read it because that's the stuff that I find really, really interesting. And that said, I'd say House of Gucci, this was published like 15 years ago. It was published after the murder, so it's a little old at this point. Um, it is very, it leans almost dry. Like it is an in-depth, bordering on dry non-fiction account from start to finish of the history of the Gucci family. It's not just about the murder. And honestly, Patrizia Reggiani is not even in it that much. Like she is, but she's the C plot in the House of Gucci non-fiction book, whereas the movie made her the main character. And I, it, it makes sense why the movie made that choice. But if you also saw the movie and were like, okay, Patrizia is the main character, but now we're getting into these weird weeds on like the, the cousins and like business drama and like corporate takeovers. That's cause that's really what the story is. It's the history of the Gucci family founding this luxury brand, the highs and the lows and how Maurizio did in many ways. It, uh, uh, there are multiple factors that kind of drove the, drove the business into the ground and led to it having to be sold um, and to make it the Gucci that it is today. It is a history of the family and the business and Patrizia is a C-plot in it. I liked it because I like going into the weeds on that stuff. I'm really interested in family dynasties and corporate <laughs> foundations and scandals. So I found that focus really interesting and it does get into finance stuff. Again, like I said with The Devil's Candy, if you really like film finance, if you really like luxury finance and just like IPOs and all that kind of stuff, like corporate battles for like who's the CEO and who has the controlling shares, this book is basically that for Gucci. Um, it was, but it did border on dry. There were times when, you know, I, 
it wasn't unput downable. I read it in chunks. I read it slowly over a number of weeks. I came up right against not reading it in time to have to return it to the library. It definitely it needed time and space. And to that end, if like me, you're interested in taking it out from the library, if you are not the fastest reader or, well, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. This isn't a purchasable for me and I'm glad I got it from the library, but you almost need more than one hold to get through it if you don't have a lot of time to dedicate to reading it. I had to push myself to a couple of late nights to finish it. Um, Cause it, it's, it's also, it's just a lot to take in. My one main criticism other than the it leans dry, I basically don't recommend this to you unless you already like nonfiction and you understand this isn't focused on the salacious true crime aspect primarily. But that actually brings me to one of my criticisms um, where sometimes I just tilted my head, scratched my head. The book in many ways fails to connect some of the business stuff with the personal stuff. And I do wish that it had been a little more well woven so that it was really clear to the reader how what what timeline things lined up. So it would be talking about Maurizio having a meltdown once he ascended to running Gucci and he was snappish and difficult to work with and making bad decisions. And like logically I knew well this was probably running parallel to his separation from Patrizia and like fighting between them and like drama with the kids and custody. But while it was talking about the business stuff, it wasn't sprinkling that in like, oh, this is when this was happening. You'd get that drama in separate chapters. And it was sometimes hard to keep track of what was happening when, because it's a natural cause and effect. If you are in a really unhappy marriage with a woman who eventually murders you, um, it makes sense that you would start to have professional meltdowns while you're having personal meltdowns. And I, I lacked that that connective tissue and I just wish it had been there because um, I think it would have made it a lot more deep and interesting because I mean it does beg a lot of questions about I mean Patricia is a character um, yeah and but also Maurizio had faults too and how they were like explosively bad for each other and kind of the fallout and how it affected the business. But the other thing it did that I personally just, I really take exception to, I, I knocked some stars off because I was just like, oh, I'm really uncomfortable with this. Um, she interviewed Patrizia Reggiani. I mean, Patrizia Reggiani doesn't shut up about this. She loves to tell her side of the story, but it's very one-sided. Maurizio is dead. We don't know what happened in a lot of cases where it was just Maurizio and Patrizia. And the author was a journalist and she did speak to a lot of people, but there are scenes that are painted quite vividly in the book that you see in the movie as well. I mean, the movie used this book as inspiration where it's all Patrizia's story of what happened. There's this one where they're in the bedroom and she alleges that he, and I'm using the word allege and the book did not journalism um, where he grabbed her by the throat. She was a, she was a small person. He was a much larger person and lifted her several feet off the ground by her throat. And he allegedly goes, this will make you taller according to Patrizia. But the book tells us as a true 100% fact of exactly how this happened and how he physically abused her and said this thing, but there's no context or corroboration. There's no, a staff member confirmed this. It's all from Patrizia's mouth. And the thing is, Patrizia um, was diagnosed on the stand during the murder trial by multiple psychologists as having narcissistic personality disorder. It just made me uncomfortable at many points where the journalist Sarah Gay Forden took as undisputable fact and relayed in narrative sections things that are only from Patrizia's point of view, who is of course going to center herself as the victim, who of course is going to center herself as like, I was justified in killing this terrible man. Maurizio is just as terrible. And while some people outside would say that he could be like an asshole to work with, for them, it is well sourced in terms of talking to a lot of people who knew Maurizio and a lot of mo how most people talk about him doesn't wash with how Patrizia talks about him. Thus, I found it odd that the book never interrogates her perspective of some of these events of their marriage where no one else was present. The man is dead. This happened with the Betty Broderick book as well, where I was just uncomfortable that like the person, you know, being smeared in public has been murdered by the person saying the things. And I think you should always exercise just some caution and some like, you know, 
step back and think about it. And so I just didn't like the book presented those things without commentary, without question. And I'm not a fan of that. I don't think that's the best journalism. <laughs> um, unless there were some corroborating witnesses that she didn't mention in the book, but a good journalist would mention her sourcing in my humble opinion. So that was a problem I had with the book. So yeah, do I recommend House of Gucci? As I said, only if you are a more seasoned nonfiction reader or you're really interested in hot la mode and kind of the business stuff behind a family business, conflicts and personalities, etc. Don't read House of Gucci if you think it's going to be like the movie, if you think it's going to be all salacious true crime, because it just isn't. I did enjoy my read, but I did have those couples with it, as I said, and found it slightly dry. The next book wasn't dry at all. So next I read, apparently there were complaints by Sharon Gless. As I said, I love a good Hollywood memoir. This is like more the rise of the golden era of television or the second golden era of television, which I just find really, really interesting. Sharon Gless famously broke out on Cagney and Lacey, feminist classic, but I am the age where I know her from Queer as Folk. She was dead on Queer as Folk, and I don't know, I've just always liked her, and so when I heard that she wrote a memoir, I was like, well, I have to get that, and this scratched every itch. I have a certain, like, the way that I like a good Hollywood memoir. I love it when they're funny. I love it when it's well written. I love it when they're candid. I definitely love it when it goes over a period of Hollywood, especially when there was still studio system kind of stuff in place. She was one of the like last actresses as part of the studio system um, of TV at NBC Universal in uh, well, just Universal in the 70s, uh, and, and like it was gone by the early 80s. I and I love it when they are honest about themselves. That's what partly what I mean by candid, like calling themselves out for things that happened. And I love when they name names of other people who were like awful, but also the good ones. And Sharon Glass does all of that. You also get her childhood and find out that, you know, like many people who make it in Hollywood, in fairness, she came from quasi Hollywood royalty ish. Her grandfather was a really famous agent in Hollywood, like had clients like, oh, I think it was like Rita Hayworth. I, I, I could be wrong, but like those sorts of clients. And then her uncle uh, worked in casting for 20th Century Fox. So like she grew up surrounded in celebrity culture. But that said, like she talks about her wealthy grandparents because she had a wealthy grandparents side and a less wealthy side and like some of the uncomfortable dynamics in her family and like she had a lot of, she had some traumas in her childhood including around like her weight and all sorts of stuff um and she oh I won't spoil some of her best stories because what I especially liked about this is there's was all the stuff I didn't know about her and like she had some fascinating like brushes with people where you go oh wow that's a tidbit and like salacious story from the Cagney and Lacey area that if I were older I would have known but it came as a delightful plot twist to me like she's talking about her life and I'm like wow it's it's really good she, like as I said she's candid about her personality her missteps but also like her triumphs about things she did that were wrong I don't want to spoil you on that on her alcoholism and having to go to rehab um, her various relationships and marriages and I really really liked it as I said it scratched every single itch and just like one like little shout out she had a chapter that made me cry I'm not the biggest crier when I read but my new trigger point is mom's dying of cancer <laughs> or people dying of cancer. She has a beautiful tribute chapter to the women in her life who were really important in her life who she's lost to cancer. Oh, I'm gonna tear up. I just thought it was really, like, I laughed, I cried, I learned about an era of, like, specifically the television that was really interesting to me. It was, here's how I would describe, apparently there were complaints by Sharon Gless. It's like you've met a fabulous new friend or maybe it's like someone you only kind of casually know but like you want to know more about them or you've admired them from afar and they you get in like a nice corner booth at the back of this fantastic restaurant and you order a ton of drinks though she shouldn't be drinking which is part of the story and you just sit for hours and hours and hours like all, next thing you know it's closing time and you want to go back to their apartment because you have to hear more of their stories and they just regale you and you're fascinated. I felt like I was having drinks with an old slash new friend who was telling me their life story and I loved I loved every minute of it. Really
really great. This sounds up your alley. I highly recommend it. Next, I brought the mood way, way down. <laughs> Because I read At Any Cost by Rebecca Rosenberg and Salim Algar. This is a true crime um, nonfiction book about, so it's a murder that I had watched on Dateline. It just stuck in my craw. It was in the back of my mind and it, it and it's something that is definitely gonna, has in, influenced a couple of my adult thriller ideas, like it's in the back of my mind. Um, and it stuck with me and I decided to look it up recently and I saw that a book had come out about it and I immediately got that book from the library. It is about the really tragic death murder of Shell Kovlin. She was a New York stockbroker. Um, she married the wrong man. She had two kids. They had it got really really bad <laughs> again if, if you I, I do rec if you like dark true crime that gets very bleak like do not do not read this this is not for the faint of heart but if you like that like deconstruction of a horrible marriage to um to a narcissistic sociopath and a horrific murder and the long frustrating road to finally get justice, read this book. I was infuriated and upset and horrified the whole time I read it, but it, it I mean, it is fascinating. It was very well written. It's incredibly tragic, however. Uh, I mean, it's a real story, like I said, I won't, but I won't spoil everything, but like it's bad. It gets very, very bad and it has an ending. This is the reason it stuck with me when I watched the Dateline episode. It had an aspect to the ending that I, I won't tell you that stuck with me that I just, to this day, I find tragic. I mean, the people involved are still alive. A lot of them are still alive and the children involved one of them is only a teenager and it's just like it, it just makes you it, it it's sad it's sad anytime someone loses their life but this isn't the first one i've read where it's a a mom who just desperately loves her kids and marries the wrong person and meets a tragic end and there's you know you're try, you're desperately trying to get justice for her um it's that it's that kind of story um, the other one I read, by the way, was Love Lies, which I, I also recommended when I read it. That was a case from North Carolina. Um, this one is is going to stick with me. I it feels weird to like heartily recommend such a horrific a book about a horrific thing, but um, if you have taken any of my recs before and you also enjoy reading these kinds of books, I do recommend it. But I do not recommend it if if you. I mean, it's it's a really horrifically abusive marriage, a lot of gaslighting, a lot of emotional manipulation, and the the fight for justice has so many low points. It it it's upsetting. <laughs> it's very upsetting. It is not a good portrait of good police work. It is um, the justice system eventually got there, but it's yeah. Um, I loved it which is weird to say. Next, inspired by pop culture media, I watched Super Pumped about Uber on Showtime, and so I read Whistleblower by Susan Fowler, because Susan Fowler is a character on the show, because Susan Fowler is a real person, and I found her subplot of the Uber show on Showtime really interesting, and then in the back of my mind I was like, oh yeah, I read that blog post. She was the woman who worked for Uber and then left Uber and wrote this really intense blog post about what it was like being a woman at Uber and all of the harassment that she faced there and how she eventually had to leave. It blew up, it went viral, it started things going down a snowball hill and she wrote a whole book about it. And it, she is a really fascinating person. Um, she's, a, she's a great writer too. And she actually just published fiction under her married name, which is Susan Rigetti. And thus, this is an above averagely written, um, like corporate memoir. I did end up getting the audiobook. I'm doing more audiobooks for nonfiction because often when I go to the library, the audiobook is available, but the ebook is not. And when I, you know, impulse control, when I want to read something right now, I love getting the audiobook. And she does narrate the audiobook herself. I think it was a six hour listen and I listened to it in one day. I was cooking and listening to it, doing some work and listening to it and I was riveted the whole time. I sometimes have issues with audiobooks where I will lose focus because I am multitasking and have to go back. 
didn't have to do it that often on this one because I was really engaged. And you do get Susan's life story, but her life story is super interesting and very relevant. What struck me with this memoir corporate whistleblower book is that it's really above average in terms of the framing, which is why I was 0% surprised to find that she's a novelist now. Very apropos because she is a storyteller. The book has an arc. It has a story arc. It has a character arc. And so you start with Susan's childhood and the unique strangeness of her childhood and how it turned her into the person that she was. She went through a similar but different instance of institutional harassment at UPenn. I won't spoil that, but that story was fascinating and enraging. You know I love some Ivy League shenanigans, and so just that portion of her story as a young adult really drew me in. And just the, the, the way, the thing she had to overcome to get where she is, uh, she was homeschooled by religious fundamentalists parents. It has like Glass Castle vibes to me in terms of kind of the texture of her childhood and how she had to overcome not having a formal or sufficient education to get into an Ivy League school and to pursue a career in physics. And then she ended up learning coding and she ends up at Uber and it's this long kind of journey. But you know, she talks about what she learned from her experiences, her enraging and awful experiences at UPenn with institutional sweeping things under the rugs and just not wanting to talk about it, to when she landed at Uber and the things that she experienced at Uber. And like what I love, we love a documenting queen. Susan Fowler is the queen of documentation. She documented everything and that's what, it's such a delight to listen to because every single thing she's like and i have documentation of this thing so you know that it's meticulously sourced it is meticulously backed up and it's just a really fascinating portrait um with broader implications uber's one company but it's not the only company where women in tech experience this kind of thing and it's not just women in tech but I just love how the story, the true story, really comes full circle. Um, it felt thematically satisfying. It was a quick read. Um, the audiobook was good. And I really enjoyed it. So if you're also interested in this topic, if you watch Super Pumped on Uber, now you know that Susan from the show has a book. And I, I do recommend it. And last but certainly not least is a book I actually started last summer and then like read a couple chapters of and then put on pause and recently came back to and it is The Secret Life of Marilyn Monroe by J. Randy Tarabarelli and I picked this up because ding 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 you guessed it who rewatched Smash over the summer I rewatched Smash over the summer and as I was watching it and oh the way that you love and hate Smash the way that you love and we all love and hate Smash um I was like I want to read a biography on Marilyn Monroe. As I said, I love golden age of Hollywood stuff. And this was actually before I started using my library and it was, I think it was on sale, but yeah, I picked this one out last summer and it is a pretty good read. I definitely feel like I have a good sense of who Marilyn was as a person. It very much focuses on, cause you know, it's called the secrets of Marilyn Monroe. I can definitely tell it had some meticulous researching. It really focuses on who she was as a person outside of her movies, how she became the person and she became um, her her upbringing, like interviewing people who knew her foster mother, who knew her actual mother, her half sister, um, her first husband, and I mean all of her husbands. And what I was most struck by was, you know, she she was really a smart cookie, but she didn't finish high school. But she was interested in things and reading in it, and like you know, Smash covered some of these same things, like in how like you know, Julia the chose the songs that she chose and I understood the whole Joe DiMaggio song now. Though it's still also interesting to see kind of how even Smash like really picks and chooses the Marilyn that they decide to use for the musical. Um, and definitely how they frame the mother in Smash is not realistic at all to reality. <laughs> her, her relationship with her mother was very, very complicated and there, there was no heartwarming song um, to be sung in that relationship, not really. But no, I loved seeing that like intimate behind the scenes portrait of Marilyn. And of course you still get the movie stuff and you still get perspective on 
why she was the way she was and, and why she had a bad reputation on set and kind of her, her role downhill and her downfall. It's made me interested to pick up at least one other book about Marilyn Monroe because I still got the niggling feeling that I was only getting like one specific lens of Marilyn or there were like places where it felt a little surface or where of course the biographer is choosing to talk about specifically what they want to talk about. Where essentially like I feel like I definitely have a good perspective on Marilyn Monroe but I don't it's it's not a biography where I feel like I really know her as intimately as I would probably want to, but it's definitely, I do think it's a very interesting portrait in terms of where she ended up, of how she got there, kind of the rise and fall of Marilyn Monroe. I think it's good for that. But yeah, I don't want this to be my only Marilyn Monroe biography that I read, but I do think it was a good starting one. I, I have a good broad picture and there was some good behind the scenes stuff. Oh, and, and it'll be interesting to see what the other biographies choose to include versus not include. But yeah, I had a good time reading it. Her life is truly fascinating. So that is all the nonfiction I've read over the last six months. It's all either fun, funny celebrity memoir or a dark, dark portrait of the worst of humanity or, you know, co corporate malfeasance or old Hollywood glam. It's like a mix of that. I'm curious, have you read any of these books? Let me know down below. Do you have book recs based off of anything that I talked about here? If you've read a good Marilyn Monroe biography, hit me up with those recs in the comments and give this video a thumbs up if you like it. Or if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and happy reading.